central banks, they, they will go right along with it because central banks were created to finance governments and wars. That's what they're there for. Tuesday, February 14th, 2023, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Today, we're going to look at how war is a racket, uh, but uh, additionally, we're going to look at how it's an inflationary racket. Highly recommend uh, this uh, short book or pamphlet. So what we're going to do today is go through the first two chapters. And then uh, tomorrow or another day, we're going to do a part two with the next two and then a part three with the final chapter. So you might not even have to buy it, but uh, I highly recommend if you have a library or uh, a couple of sh uh, shelves like I do uh, that you uh, get one. Uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, thank you all again for the interest in the channel and uh, Ask, uh, I ask you to make sure you uh, like my videos, <laughs> if you like them, of course. I'm not telling you should like all my videos. I also ask you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and also hit that little notification bell uh, to be notified of all my new videos. So why are we talking about War is a Racket today? Uh, <laughs> well... I saw uh, a story uh, this morning, and uh, here we go. Where is it? Yeah, JP Morgan Inc.'s agreement with Zelensky on rebuilding Ukraine's infrastructure seeds $20 billion plus. And then we've seen a few weeks ago as well, Zelensky, BlackRock CEO, Fink, agreed to coordinate Ukraine investment. I also saw that uh, Ukraine had a uh, like a stand, kind of a, a house um, in Davos at, at the uh, last uh, World Economic Forum uh, summit there uh, this winter. And uh, they wouldn't have been there <laughs> if they're not looking to get capital from all the big uh, corporations, uh, the globalist corporations that surround the World Economic Forum. And then also here in the UK, uh, I've seen uh, a guy uh, who's an MP and he's the Tory chair of the Commons Defence Committee. Uh, his name is Tobias Elwood. He's a former, uh, he's a like retired military guy, but he's part of the 77th uh, Brigade, which is like a, a part of the UK Armed Forces that basically conducts information war on social media and other platforms uh, supposedly against foreign enemies and he's been calling for uh, a lot of uh, military spending increases like uh, there's a story here from uh, let's see when it was february 10th uk armed forces would last just five days in the war senior mp warns uh, Tory chair of defense committee says cost of replacing kits sent to Ukraine and high inflation had created a really grim picture. And then this is from uh, him again on forces.net. This is the 12th of February. Peacetime defense budget not fit for new era of insecurity. Tobias Elwood warns. So you see they're pushing for more military spending. And that's why I want to look at uh, war is an inflationary racket <laughs> and uh, the other the reason why I decided to say it's an inflationary racket is because the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has just nominated Kazuo Ueda to head the Bank of Japan from the 1st of April I think and apparently he's called uh, the Ben Bernanke of Japan <laughs> and we know that Ben Bernanke is an inflation uh, creature He's the guy who pushed all the QE, the zero rates. So what this is telling me is that the West, and yes, Japan is part of the West, even though it's in Asia, is going to continue the inflationary spending. And I'm not saying this is not going to happen in Russia or China either. All parties will benefit from this insecurity, as Tobias Elwood uh, uh, calls it. 
So let's start with War is a Racket by Smedley Butler. So Smedley Butler, uh, he was awarded uh, two Congressional Medal uh, of Honor uh, for the capture of the of Veracruz, Mexico, 1914, and the capture of Fort Riviere, Haiti, 1917. Distinguished Service Medal, 1919, Major General United States Marine Corps, uh, retired October 1st, 1931, on leave of absence uh, to act as Director of Department of Safety, Philadelphia, 1932. He was a lecturer in the 1930s, a Republican candidate for Senate, 1932. Died at Naval Hospital in Philadelphia, 1940. So let's get on with it. Chapter one, War is a Racket. War is a Racket, it has always been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is uh, the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of people. Only a small inside group knows what it is about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few, at the expense of the very many. Out of war, uh, a few people make huge fortunes. In the World War, uh, that's World War I, a mere handful garnered the profits of the conflict. At least 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires were made in the United States during the World War. That many admitted their huge blood gains in their income tax returns. How many other war millionaires falsified their tax returns? No one knows. How many of these uh, war millionaires shouldered a rifle? How many of them uh, dug a trench? How many of them knew what it meant to go hungry in a rat infested dugout? How many of them spent sleepless frightened nights ducking shells and shrapnel and machine gun bullets? How many of them parried a bay bayonet thrust of an enemy? How many of them were wounded or killed in battle? Out of war nations acquire additional territory if they're victorious. Well, in, in the modern case, I, I'd say they acquire a kind of client states as well. They don't take over the territory officially, but they, they might as well have. They just take it, this newly acquired territory promptly is exploited by the few, the self-same few who wrung dollars out of blood in the war. The general public shoulders the bill. Well, that's the inflation that comes after the wars. And what is the bill? Well, this bill renders a horrible accounting. Newly placed gravestones, mangled bodies. Well, that's for the Ukrainians and the Russian uh, soldiers there. Shattered minds, broken hearts and homes. Economic instability. Yeah, we know about that. Depression and all its attendant miseries. Backbreaking taxation for generations and generations for a great many years as a soldier i had a suspicion that war was a racket not until i retired to civil life did i fully realize it now that i see the international war clouds gathering as they are today i must face it and speak out again they're choosing sides france and russia met and agreed to stand side by side. Italy and Austria hurried to make a similar agreement. Poland and Germany cast sheep's eyes at each other, forgetting uh, for the nonce uh, their dispute over the Polish corridor. So there you go, the taking of sides. NATO uh, versus Russia versus China now, all the balloon story. So what I'm gonna do here is quickly go uh, to chapter two. Uh, I, I thought that was an interesting uh, description of uh, what war is. But chapter two is really interesting because it talks about who makes uh, the profits and, why, uh, and how they make it. The World War, rather our brief participation in it, has caused the United States some 
$52 billion, figure it out. That means $400 uh, to every uh, American man, woman, and child. And we haven't paid the debt yet. Well, the debt is still growing, unfortunately. We are paying it. Our children will pay it. And our grandchildren's children probably will still be paying the cost of that war. The normal profits of a business concern in the United States are 6, 8, 10, and sometimes 12%. But wartime profits are, ah, that is another matter, 20, 60, 100, 300, and even 1800%. The sky is the limit. All that traffic will bear. Uncle Sam has the money. Let's get it. Of course, it isn't put that crudely in wartime. It is dressed into speeches about patriotism, love of country. And we must all put our shoulders to the wheel, but the profits jump and leap and skyrocket and are safely pocketed. Let's just take a few examples. Take our friends, the DuPonts, the powder people, didn't one of them testify before a Senate committee recently that their powder won the war or saved the world for democracy or something? How did they do in the war? They were a patriotic corporation. While the average earnings of the DuPonts for the period 1910 to 1914 were $6 million a year, it wasn't much, but the DuPonts managed to get along on it. Now let's look at their average yearly profit during the war years, 1914 to 1918. $58 million a year uh, profit we find. Nearly 10 times that of normal times, and the profits of normal times were pretty good. An increase in profits of, of more than 950%. Take one of our little steel companies that patriot patriotically shunted aside the making of rails and girders and, and bridges to manufacture war materials. Well, their 1910 to 1914 yearly earnings averaged six million. Then came the war and like loyal citizens, Bethlehem Steel promptly turned to munitions making. Did their profits jump? Or did they let Uncle Sam in for a bargain? Well, their 1914-18 average was 49 million a year. Or let, let's take United States Steel. The normal earnings during the five-year period uh, prior to the war were 105 million a year. Not bad. Then along came the war and up went the profits. The average yearly profit for the period 1914-18 was 240 million, not bad. And he goes on and on uh, looking at different companies. And uh, so you get the idea. Um, and there's a part here which shows how there's a lot of waste and, and a lot of uh, extra costs that the, you, uh, the taxpayer, not just in the US, but the, in the UK will bear. So it says here, page 25, under shirt, shirts for soldiers cost 14 cents to make and Uncle Sam paid 30 cents to 40 cents each for them, a nice little profit for the undershirt manufacturer and the stocking manufacturer and the uniform manufacturers and the cap manufacturers and the steel helmet, helmet manufacturers all got theirs. Why, when the war was over, some four million sets of equipment, knapsacks and the things that go to fill them, crammed warehouses on this side. Not that they're being scrapped uh, because the regulations have changed the contents, but the manufacturers collected their wartime profits on them and they will do it uh, all over again the next time. There were lots of brilliant ideas for profit making during the war. One very versatile patriot sold Uncle Sam 12 dozen 48 inch wrenches. Oh, 
they were very nice wrenches. Uh, the only trouble was that there was only one nut ever made that uh, was large enough for the wrenches. That is one uh, that holds the turbines at Niagara Falls. Well, after Uncle Sam had bought them and the manufacturer had pocketed the profit, the wrenches were put on a freight car and shunted all around the United States in an effort to find a use for them. When the armistice was signed, it was indeed a sad blow to the wrench manufacturer. He was just about to make some, some nuts to fit the wrenches. Then he planned to sell these two to you, to your Uncle Sam. So we're going to stop here. And uh, so you get the idea of why war is a racket. And uh, we're seeing the same thing uh, evolve right now. Maybe he is not has not got to do so much uh, with what he said back in during World War uh, One, but I think it's uh, yeah it, it's happening uh, in in Ukraine. It's going to happen in South Southeast Asia probably with Taiwan, and you can bet they're going to keep drumming up insecurity, and uh, we're going to be paying. We're paying it, paying for that still here in the UK. After over a hundred years, uh, that's why our currency uh, has gone down the drain over the last hundred years. Yes, it's accelerating lower now. It, it's all the inflation. The the best way for governments to pay uh, for their debt is to inflate away their currency, uh, and, and that's why I keep saying you need to have um, sound money. You need to have gold and silver to protect your savings, especially. In, in the current environment. And yes, I know we're gonna get CPI today. That's expected to uh, actually drop a little bit, I think, from uh, 6.4 to 6.2, but that doesn't really matter. That's just like a, a distraction. What you need to know is that this war spending, new era of insecurity, will make sure that they're gonna keep uh, fiscal spending. And you can uh, bet that the, the, the um, Central banks, they, they will go right along with it because central banks were created to finance governments and wars. That's what they're there for. And you're going to be paying for it. Your, uh, your children, your grandchildren and great-grandchildren are going to be paying for it. And the only way to maybe leave them a, a legacy, whatever it may be, is to have a, a little bit of gold and silver on the side and hold on to it for dear life, I would say. Uh, so now we're going to look at the markets. After I look at the markets, I'm going to look at some of your questions from last week. So here we go. Uh, it's 10 past 8 a.m. London time. Uh, we got spot gold uh, trading at 18.59. That's up five dollars. High's been 65. Low's been 52. Uh, silver is down 11 cents now. It's trading at 21.86. High's been 2205. Uh, we're right near the lows here at uh, 85. Dow Future is down 55. NASDAQ 100 Future is down 5. S&P Future is down 4 points. To the currencies, uh, sterling is up slightly, 121.47. The euro is up 0.1 of a percent, 107.36. Uh, the dollar is down a third versus the yen, 132.01. And uh, the dollar is unchanged versus the U1 at 682.24. Aussie dollar is unchanged, 69.63. Dollar is unchanged versus the Canadian dollar. So it all seems to be fairly quiet. Uh, the Kiwi dollar, on the other hand, is uh, down a third of a percent at 63.36. Uh, platinum uh, is uh, unchanged, trading around 956. Platinum is traded back up a little bit from yesterday's uh, price. Uh, WTI crude is uh, down uh, just under a percent at 79.60. Brent is down uh, half a percent at 86. High grade copper is up 0.2 at 407.70. So let's check the government bond market. The U.S. 10-year yield is down three basis points at 368. Uh, the U.K., let's check the U.K. Uh, yields uh, continue to creep up here. The two-year yield is up uh, slightly at 364. 
The 10-year is up uh, two basis points at 342, and the 30-year is up two and a half at uh, 384. We're going to continue to keep a close eye on gilt yields. Uh, in Japan, the 10-year yield uh, is uh, safely below 50 basis points. Uh, it has traded up to that level today, but it's, it hasn't traded above it. So with that, uh, we're going to look at uh, some of your questions from last week. We're going to start with three of them uh, today. This is from Chris L., and this is from the video, the, the next black swan will come out of the derivatives market. And Chris's question is, are CFDs and OTCs the same thing? Thanks. So yes, uh, CFDs are derivatives. They're contract, uh, contracts for difference. And uh, yes, they're, they're traded over the counter. Uh, they're not uh, quoted on an exchange, so they would be an OTC. Uh, an over-the-counter instrument. Uh, this is from the same video. Uh, this is from KQ. You mentioned a book some time ago about what happens to society during the fall of a fiat currency. Can you please refresh my memory, memory to what that book was? Thank you. Uh, sure, and now I'll give you two books actually that talk about the topic what happens when currencies collapse. The first one is uh, When Money Dies uh, by Adam Ferguson. And this is about the, uh, the German Weimar hyperinflation in the early 1920s. The second book is Fiat Money Inflation in France, How It Came, What It Brought, and How It Ended by Andrew Dixon White. And, and this one is about uh, what happened to France in the 1790s, post or during the uh, French Revolution. And uh, yeah, uh, this is a very good one too. I, I highly recommend both. Uh, question three. Uh, this is from John Jeffries, and the video is, this is the end of uh, this current fiat money experiment. And this was an interview I did with Lyn Lynette Zhang of ITM Trading. Uh, John says, great video, thank you. The most money ever uh, has been created and the world has a liquidity problem. Where is it going? Well, the problem is that, yeah, money and credit are the same. So uh, the problem is that real money is very scarce, i.e. gold and silver and even the paper cash. Uh, so like when you put your uh, deposit in a bank, uh, $100, the bank leverages that and uh, buys all kinds of uh, illiquid assets in order to try to make a profit. And that's what creates all the debt. But the cash or money itself <laughs> it is a small part of that. So when things get rough and people want to liquidate those illiquid assets, there's not enough cash it's uh, because it's a Ponzi scheme. It's in the nature of a, the fractional reserve system. Yeah. So the more debt and credit or money uh, we get, the less actually real money and cash we have. That That's why uh, liquidity is a problem and it will probably get worse. So there you go with that. I wish you all a, a very good day. Take care. Bye.